In chapter 7, section 3, we continue our study of oblique triangles. In section 2, we identified the law of sines. We uh, saw how to derive it, and then we applied it to our first two cases. Let's go ahead and list our four possible cases for oblique triangles again. We already discussed case 1 and case 2. Case 1 is when we know two angles and one side. So one side and any two angles is our first case. We're going to use law of sines with that. Our second case is our ambiguous case. We know two sides and an angle that is not included. So two sides, uh, one angle not included. And this is our ambiguous case. We have to remember to check for that second triangle. Uh, but for both of those, we start with law of sines. In this section, we're going to focus on cases three and four, and we're going to learn about the law of cosines. Case three is when I know two sides and the included angle. So side, angle, side, in that order. Uh, side, angle, side of any triangle. And then case four is when I know my three sides. So I don't know any angles, I know those three sides. For these two cases, we have to start with the law of cosines because we don't have a pair. Um, by a pair, remember when we were working with our law of sines, if I have triangle ABC, if I have a pair, that means I know an angle and the side opposite that angle. That would be a pair. Well, if what I have is side, angle, side, I have one angle, but I don't know the side opposite that angle, so I don't have that pair. <coughs> okay, law of cosines follows a pattern. Notice um, if I have c squared as my side measure over here, let me see if I can get this to focus in a little bit better for us. Okay, that's a little better. If I have c squared over here solved for c squared, then I have cosine c. If I have it solved for b squared, I have cosine b. If I have it solved for a squared, I have cosine a. My pattern in here will follow. If I'm starting with c squared and angle c, then I have a squared, b squared, 2ab. Notice it is plus and then minus. If I have b squared cosine b, then I have a squared c square to ac. If I have it set for a, then I'm using b square c square to bc. For the rest of this page, we're going to consider the proof of the law of cosines. We're going to see how it is derived, how we get the law of cosines so that it is always true. Consider the triangle from 7-2, but now we're going to strategically place it on our rectangular coordinate system so that the vertex of my triangle is at the origin and this side is on the positive x-axis. The vertex of angle B, angle B right here, has coordinates A cosine C, A sine C. A cosine C, A sine C. The vertex of angle A right here is B units from the origin and I haven't gone up or down so the coordinates are B zero. This is going to be true whether angle C is acute or obtuse. It's not going to make any different watch difference what shape my triangle is. Now notice that um, A is not necessarily one. We haven't said it is on the unit circle, not, not necessarily my unit circle, which means that A doesn't have to be one, right? A can be anything. Not necessarily on the unit circle where A is one. That doesn't have to be the case. A can be anything. We're talking about any possible triangle. Use the distance formula to find a simplified value of c squared. Remember my distance formula is basically my Pythagorean theorem. We've got the difference of the x's squared plus the difference of the y's squared. So if we take the difference of the x's, we're going to subtract these two coordinates. So I'm going to have b minus a cosine c squared. 
And I'm going to add to that the difference in the y coordinates. So 0 minus a sine c squared. Okay, square each of these binomials. For the first one, I get b squared, my outside and inside product times 2 gives me negative 2ab cosine c. And then this term squared is plus a squared cosine squared c. Then for this binomial, anything times 0 is 0. So I just end up squaring this term, which gives me plus a squared sine squared c. Okay, let's think about regrouping. Let's group together these last two terms. So we're just going to copy down b squared minus 2ab cosine c. And then from these two terms, I'm going to factor out the common factor. So plus a squared times cosine squared c plus sine squared c. Now, cosine squared c plus sine squared c, does that ring any bells? Hopefully so. That is our Pythagorean identity. That's equal to 1. And 1 times a square is just a square. So what I have now is, if I kind of put it, rearrange it a little bit, I have a squared times 1, which is just a square, plus b squared minus 2ab cosine c. And that's equal to c squared. Ta-da! So I have found this first version, solved for c, of my law of cosines. Now here is an interesting thing. What if C were a right angle? Well, what's the cosine of a right angle? What's cosine at 90 degrees? It's 1. So, or no, cosine at 90 degrees is 0. So that means this goes away, and I'm left with C squared equals A squared plus B squared. Right triangle, Pythagorean theorem. So actually, our Pythagorean theorem that you've known forever is just a special case of the law of cosines. So you have known one case of the law of cosines for a long, long time. That green theorem is a special case of the law of cosines, where C is 90 degrees, cosine of C is 0, and so that last term goes away. Okay, so that was fun. Let's do our next example on the next page. Now, okay, so back to our law of cosines. Why don't we just always use our law of cosines? Well, it's more work than the law of sines. Law of sines is a lot simpler and quicker to use than the law of cosines. So when we don't have to use the law of cosines, we don't want to automatically just start with it for fun. Okay, we're given three pieces of information about a triangle, an oblique triangle. We need to sketch it first and then solve. Solve means we're going to find the other three pieces of information about this triangle. So I label my sketch correctly and try to get through this section without mislabeling a single triangle. Angle A is 35 degrees. Side B is 5 and side C is 8. So I don't know side A. This is a side angle side triangle. Order matters. I have my included angle. What this means is that I don't know, have a pair here. I can't start. Um, I can't start with law of sines because I don't have an angle and its opposite side. So I have to do something to get to the point where I can start. Well, the thing we're going to do is solve for side A. We're going to solve for side A using our law of cosines, where we have a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine a. We don't know a, we're solving for a, so we've got square root of b is 5, c is 8, 2bc cosine of 35 degrees. You see why this is more work, right? Um, so when I use my calculator to plug all this in, order of operations matters, I've got 25 plus, uh, six, plus uh, 64, yep. 
minus um, 80 times the cosine of 35 degrees. What you should get under there, and I don't want you to round it off, but what you should get underneath that radical should look something like this and then keep going. And then you're going to take the square root of that and you should get a value for A of approximately 4.84. Now, that is a found value that we're going to have to use to finish solving our triangle to find angles B and C. We now know all three side measures, but we are going to have to use that found value to find our other two, our, our next angle measure. Now, we have two angles left. We have angle B and angle C that we need to find. Which one do we start with and does it matter? It does. Um, you are always when you're having to use the law of cosines in your problem, you always want to start with a smaller angle. Start with the smaller angle. If you'll just get into that habit, it will, it will do you good. Well, okay, here's a question. How do I know which one's the smaller angle? Well, the smaller angle is going to be opposite the shorter side, right? So the smaller angle is going to be opposite the shorter side. If one of these two angles, B or C, happen to be obtuse, it would have to be C because C is the longest side largest angle. If I start with the smaller angle, I know for a fact it is not obtuse, so I can use the law of sines without worrying. Now what do I mean I can use the law of sines without wor worrying? Well, let's think about our circle and what quadrants are our um, inverse functions are defined in. Law of sines, sine inverse, is defined in quadrants 4 and 1, right? If it's positive, we're in quadrant 1. And if it's an acute angle, that's great. But what if it were an obtuse angle? Well, an obtuse angle, it's not, law of sines isn't going to return me an obtuse angle. What if it, what if instead of this angle, I really need that angle? I'm not going to get that angle from law of sines. I'm just going to get the smaller one because the only place I'm going to get a positive sine function value and get an angle back for using sine inverse, it's going to be in quadrant one. Sine inverse is restricted. If I plug in a positive sine function value, I get an angle in quadrant one. If I plug in a negative sine function value, I get an angle in quadrant four. There's no way that law of sines using sine inverse is going to give me a, an obtuse angle that would fall in quadrant two. So if I start with my smaller angle, I know my smaller angle is going to fall in quadrant one. It's going to be acute. So I can use law of sines. I find that acute angle. And then I just subtract from 180 to get the third angle. I don't have to worry about it. Okay, so let's um, use law of sines to get our second angle. Again, we're going to find B because we know it is smaller, so it's not going to be obtuse. So we're going to use our pair that we have found this value, 4.84. And we're going to say sine of 35 degrees over 4.84 is going to be equal to sine of B over 5. We know angle B is acute because angle C is bigger. So sine of B is equal to 5 sine of 35 degrees over 4.84. And then I'm going to take sine inverse of that to solve for B, right? When I take sine inverse, I know that B needs to be acute, so I'm not worried about it. It's going to be okay. 5 times sine of 35 degrees divided by 4.84, take sine inverse. That should come out to be about 0.59. I take sine inverse of that, and I get an angle value of 36.3 degrees for angle B. When I add that to my given value of 35 for A and subtract it from 180, I get a value of angle C of 108.7. Look at that. C was obtuse. Now, just to prove to you that I'm not crazy, that I know what I'm talking about, we are going to come over here to a blank sheet of paper, and we're going to say what if. Okay, we're going to say what if. 
what if we hadn't started with sine of b? What if we had started with angle c? We had said sine of 35 degrees over 4.84 is going to be equal to sine of c over 8. Right? That's my other angle. Okay. Well, that means sine of c is equal to 8 sine 35 degrees over 4.84. And I take sine inverse here. What do you get for angle C? You get an acute angle. So let's go ahead and do it together. We've got um, we've got eight. Oops, clear. Sorry, guys. Eight times the sine of thirty-five degrees divided by four point eight four. I get a value that works. It's within my domain of my sine or my range of my sine function, domain of the inverse. Take sine inverse of that answer, and I get an acute angle because when I plug in a positive sine function value into the inverse, it's restricted. It's going to have to give me an acute angle in quadrant one. That's not right. That angle is not acute. This is not the ambiguous case. There is only one possible triangle this triangle could be, and it is the triangle where, where B is 36 degrees and C is 108. It is not a triangle where C is 71 degrees. Because I used law of sine with an angle that was obtuse, it can't give me, like sine inverse cannot give me an obtuse angle. I got the wrong result. So make sure, if you have to start a problem with law of cosines, make sure that you go back and you always go to the smaller of the angles remaining when you are ready to use law of sine. Okay, let's do our second example. We're given information about a triangle. Let's sketch our triangle, A, B, C. Oh, look at that. We are given three sides. None of those letters are capital. Those are all side measures. Side A is 6, side B is 8, side C is 5. So we are going to have to use law of cosines. Now, when I'm using law of sines, my rule is to start with a smaller angle because I know that I'm going to mess it up if my angle is supposed to be obtuse. Your rule for law of cosines, and I have to start with law of cosines here. I do not have any angles. Think about how cosine inverse is defined. Cosine inverse is defined here. Cosine inverse is defined for quadrants 1 and 2. If I have an obtuse angle and I'm using cosine inverse, I'm fine. I'm going to find it. So if I'm having to use my law of cosines to find my first angle, find the big one. If I don't have any angles and I know I'm using law of cosines to find an angle, start with the largest. Start with the largest angle so that you've gotten your obtuse angle out of the way because you're going to find it with law of cosines. Do I have to worry about there being more than one obtuse angle in a triangle? Nope. If I have an obtuse angle, that's the only obtuse angle there can be. So I'm going to start with the big one. For this triangle, which one's going to be the big one? Well, it's going to be angle B because angle B is opposite the longest side. So here I go. B squared equals A squared plus C squared minus 2AC cosine angle B. I need to solve this for angle B, so I'm going to rearrange my terms. I'm going to move this term over so that I have 2AC cosine B. That's equal to A squared plus C squared minus B squared. And then I'm going to need to divide it by 2AC.
Now there's a couple of different ways to rearrange this. What's important is that you end up with cosine b equal to, and then you plug in all of this information. So if I if I have it this way, a squared plus b squared minus or a squared plus c squared minus b squared divided by two ac. A squared, I've got six squared plus five squared minus eight squared over two times six times five. When you do this arithmetic, you should get about negative 0 0.05. I've got to finish solving for B by doing cosine inverse, right? So I plug that in and take cosine inverse. I get angle B as 92.9 degrees, about 92.9 degrees. It was obtuse. That means the other two angles are both going to be acute. So I don't need to worry about order. That's the first angle I found. Let's do the second angle we find. Um, let's find A. Now, do I have to do law of cosines again to find angle A? Well, unless I'm going to use a find value, found value, I have to use law of cosines one more time to find angle A. I am going to go ahead and start with the rearranging here. So I'm going to say um, cosine of A equals and then I have a b squared plus c squared minus a squared over 2bc. And I'm going to plug in everything that I know so that I have, let's see, I have 8 squared plus 5 squared minus 6 squared over 2 times 8 times 5. And then I take the cosine inverse of that, and I get a value for angle A. You should get about 48.5 degrees if I've written it all down correctly and you plug it all correctly into your calculator. So that's the first angle. That's the second angle. How do you find your third angle? Well, the sum of the three is going to be 180. So I can just add those two together, and what's left over is my third angle, in this case, angle C. All right, one more example here. This is a, an application problem. Like I said, a trig is an excellent vehicle for application problems. Okay, a yacht leaves St. Thomas bound for St. Croix, 40 miles away, maintaining a constant speed of 23 miles per hour, but encountering heavy crosswinds and strong currents, the crew finds after one hour that the yacht is off course by 41 degrees. How far is it from St. Croix at this time? Well, we need to sketch a triangle, or at least part of a triangle. So our, our yacht leaves St. Thomas bound for St. Croix. St. Thomas bound for St. Croix, and they are 40 miles apart. Our yacht travels for 23, uh, maintains a constant, travels for one hour. Yep, there we go. Travels for one hour at 23 miles an hour. So our yacht's going to go 23 miles and then is off course by 41 degrees. So travels 23 miles, is off course by 41 degrees. We want to know if they're here, how far are they from their destination at St. Croix. So what information do we have? We have side, angle, side. We want this missing side value, but we don't have, we can't use law of sines because we don't have a pair. So we're gonna to have to use law of cosines. So we can solve for this distance by saying, okay, that's gonna be equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the other sides minus two times the product of those sides and cosine of 41 degrees.
when you plug all that in, you should get 21, 29 minus, eh, I'm gonna make it approximate here, but you, you will not round it in your calculator. What you should come out with is about 27.2 miles away. How much time has been added to the trip? So now their trip was gonna take them, you know, a certain length of time. How much time is it gonna take them now? Um, well, they were going to have to go, originally, the plan was to go 40 miles at 23 miles per hour, right? So how long would that take them? That would take them 1.74 hours, originally. Now, how far are they having to go? Well, they went 23 miles, they still have 27 miles to go. So that's 40, that's about 50 miles. So now they're going about 50 miles at 23 miles an hour. So the total trip is going to take them 2.17 hours instead. Which one of those is my answer? Well, neither one. <laughs> How much time has been added? Well, what's the difference between those two? So it's going to take, um, if I subtract that, I get, it's going to take almost half an hour longer. Nope, nope, not half. Yep, almost half an hour longer. So almost half an hour longer. If I took 0.43 times 60 minutes in an hour, 28.8 minutes longer to complete this trip.